Back in 2001, Tecmo busted into the horror game scene with Fatal Frame, and it was totally different from what we've come to expect from the genre. You weren't defending yourself with pipes or firearms, but by instead taking pictures of the ghosts. In a world full of games that had you keeping your distance, here was a game that required you to stare the things that scared you in the face, and it was scary. Damn scary, so much so that a lot of people couldn't finish the game because of it. Jumping on through this thing last week, there was a lot I loved about it, and a lot I wasn't huge on. The inventive combat and chilling atmosphere laid down a great framework for an amazing horror game, but the lame puzzles, clunky storytelling, and repetitive exploration left a lot to be desired. When working on a sequel to the game, they sought to create a more engaging story, one that would better grab players and encourage them to brave up and see the game to the end. Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly was the fruit of their efforts. This seems to be the Silent Hill 2 of the series, you know, like that legendary sequel that everybody claims is the best one of the series. Unlike movie sequels, game sequels do tend to be better than the original. You get to expand upon what worked throughout what didn't, and try even more ideas on top of that. And by the sounds of things, the game's director was listening to fan feedback. I didn't really love the first game. There's things I loved about it, but overall, I think it could have been a lot better, so so I'm actually pretty stoked to crack into this thing. Not to judge a book by its cover, but the box art's already a lot better. Different from the Japanese artwork that once again depicts the main characters, but it's still pretty great looking, and it continues to sport the theme of symmetry, which does relate well to the game's story. Unlike this upside down floating headman thing. Also bonus points for actually using the game's fontless side cover this time. I just realized the Tecmo logo has 100% games beside it. What does that mean? Like, oh good, I, I thought they were only 87% games. Warning, do not play this game alone. Or what? What's gonna happen? A ghost gonna get me? All you weirdos in the comments mad that I said ghosts aren't real. Sorry, but they're not. Similar to Silent Hill 2, Fatal Frame 2's story is completely separate from that of the first game. We follow brand new characters and a brand new story, no direct correlation to anything from the first game. Here we have Mio and Mayu, a pair of twins hanging out in the woods. It's made pretty clear right away that these sisters are incredibly close, promising each other to always be by each other's side. Didn't we always promise each other that we would always be together? Mio then has a flashback to when they were kids, running ahead of Mayu and leaving her behind. Mayu then falls off a cliff and breaks her leg, an injury which has certainly left its mark, causing Mayu to walk with a limp to this very day. Mio quite clearly feels a lot of guilt because of this, and that drives a newfound feeling of responsibility for looking after her sister. Mayu, on the other hand, has developed quite the separation anxiety. Getting left behind or being separated from her sister are the last things she wants, and it seems like she's become quite clingy because of it. Is your leg okay? Does it hurt? It does a little bit. I'm fine. Wow, the voice acting's actually not bad this time. Certainly a huge upgrade from the monotone and excessive articulation from the first game. It is so much better. And the characters are better developed, too. Right out of the gate, we know a lot more about them and have much more reason to care about these two than the boring scarecrow of a character Miku was in the first game. After coming out of her flashback days, Mio notices that Mayu has run off, chasing this red butterfly into the woods. After giving chase, she's met with these bizarre and disturbing visions of a girl in a kimono being strangled. Coming out of the shock, it's now nighttime for some reason, and Mio and Mayu find themselves on the outskirts of a lost village. Confused and made curious by these visions, they decide to go explore. The gameplay here is identical to that of the first game. You've got those fixed angles, that run button that propels you forward even when you're not moving the stick, and of course, the camera obscura, which I guess they're calling it now. The camera obscura. Unlike the first game where Miku and Mafuyu inherited the camera from their mother, Mio and Mayu don't have any prior connection to it. They simply find it here in the village, and it's implied that it's a different camera entirely, not the exact one involved in the first game. It's soon revealed that the camera belonged to an outsider who was visiting the village and was using it to film the rituals that took place there, but after unforeseen circumstances, the camera was lost and abandoned. Once again, you'll use this thing to photograph ghosts in self-defense, and the whole system here works a little bit differently this time. There's no longer 
longer those sounds and a big glowing meter to tell you your exact level of charge, which I immediately didn't like as much. I felt like there was less communication here, it wasn't as legible or instantly clear how much charge you had at any given time, but the more encounters I had, the more it really started to grow on me. It feels less video gamey, less arcade-like, you don't have all of those boops and beeps and flashy lights, there's no vivid spectacle this time, instead it's quieter, more subdued, and I think it makes your encounters with these ghosts all the more sinister. Charging up your shot also functions a little bit differently, instead of keeping the cursor on the ghost to charge up your shot, the power of your shot now seems to be dictated by the distance between you and the ghost, so the closer you are, the more filled up the gauge will become. This time the combat has a much higher focus on shutter chances. This was a thing that was present in the first game, it's when a ghost performs a certain action, like usually winding up for an attack, and you snap the photo just at the right moment when the cursor turns red to do a ton of damage. These moments seem to arise more frequently in Fatal Frame 2, and your normal attacks won't do nearly as much damage as these now, so your strategy will more prominently be to bait the ghosts into attacking and then taking the photograph at just the right moment. It took a little bit of adjusting, but I did start to like these changes a lot. It encourages you to get up in the ghost's face, which makes the combat all the more riskier. It's also a lot more common to encounter multiple ghosts at once here. This happened like once, maybe twice in the first game, but here it'll happen quite a bit. You'll try to position yourself just right so you can get all three in the frame at once so you can save up on film, and that adds a little bit more strategy. And you also kind of get to feel more like a photographer, you know, like moving around, getting the shot just right, and and as somebody that does photography myself, I was super into this. Uh, some people might know this, but uh, back when I was in film school, cinematography was my big thing. And that's basically photography, just in motion. So I was crazy into this. Uh, also, I quickly want to say, I should have said this in the first video, I absolutely love that it's the R1 button that snaps the photo. Because where is that finger on a camera? It's perfect. It would have been absurd if they picked any other button, but they got it right. Just like before, you've got different types of film that give you varying degrees of power, but this time you can't get infinite film from a save point. Instead, the Type 14 film is now completely finite. You'll only have as much as you'll find laying around. But if you ran out of film completely, you'd softlock the game, right? You wouldn't be able to progress. Well, the solution to that problem is much better this time. You do have an infinite amount of the new Type 7 film, which is this super weak film that barely does any damage at all. So it's sort of like the equivalent of running out of ammo and getting stuck with a knife. Still technically possible, but man, things are gonna be pretty freaking hard for you. So you gotta make the absolute most out of your limited resources, because your unlimited resources aren't very good. There was also some pretty big changes to how the power-ups work. Instead of using up a spirit orb, which you really only found so many of as you explored, you'll instead charge up a little meter at the bottom left as you land each shot. When the meter's charged up enough, you can then use a special. I like this a lot better. Not only does it give you more incentive to actually use your power-ups this time, but also because it felt like I could only use like 15 in the entire game before. Now I don't have to worry about that at all. Instead, it feeds into this dynamic, rewarding you for landing precise shots with a good move to gain better ground on the ghost. Different powers will use up different amounts of energy. The power-ups in question are all fairly similar to what they were in the first game. You can freeze a ghost, push a ghost back, slow him down. The best one by a mile, though, was the Zero Lens, which is essentially just a super-powered shot that does an incredible amount of damage. I always felt like I was getting the most out of my limited amount of film by using this one. You now unlock these one by one as you progress through the game. You'll find these lenses as you explore, each one unlocking a new ability. I absolutely love the idea of different lenses being what gives you different power-ups because that's sort of representative of what a real camera's like. Different lenses give you different effects. Spirit orbs come back, but they're now for upgrading your camera instead of being for using those abilities. Uh, just like before, you'll earn experience by snapping pictures of ghosts, but before you can invest it into an ability or an aspect of your camera, you'll first have to use a spirit orb to unlock that level. The upgrades are pretty similar to before, increasing the range and the reticle size, and this time the amount of energy you can hold to use those specials. But you can also upgrade the specials themselves so you can get a feel for which ones you find most useful, and then invest your points into the ones you like. 
Now, there are some changes to the ghost encounters that I do feel like are a bit of a downgrade over the first game. Firstly, you no longer have those incredibly subtle audio and vibration cues. You don't sense the ghost in your controller and have the music change ever so slowly. You don't really get those freaky moments of anticipation as much anymore. Now, it's much more apparent when a ghost is nearby. You'll usually see them and know exactly what you're dealing with right away. That and the ghost designs just aren't nearly as scary this time. Some of these things were so deformed and moved so inhumanly in the first game, but in Fatal Frame 2, they all just kind of look like people. Nothing terribly disturbing or all that unsettling. I imagine the scariness might have been toned down a little bit deliberately, probably in hopes that this would give people an easier time finishing the game, since so many people said they didn't before because it was too scary. It's sort of a shame though, because even as somebody that plays a lot of horror games and isn't all that easily scared by them, I found Fatal Frame legitimately terrifying, and Fatal Frame 2 just didn't quite scratch that itch as thoroughly for me. Not to say the game's not scary at all, it still does have its brilliant moments, like, you're really just gonna put that there? Really? And, oh, okay, uh, alright. Oh lord, sweet Jesus, this thing falling off the shelf near gave me a heart attack. The atmosphere and the music continued to be as excellent as before. I still felt pretty creeped out as I explored each area. And I gotta say, if there's one thing they did right this time, it's that. These environments are so much more interesting to explore than the first game, and considerably less redundant too. Instead of recycling the same mansion over and over, you've now got an entire village to explore, complete with multiple buildings to go through as you search for your sister, and a way out. Throughout the game, Mayu will continuously be led astray by these spirits, acting as like she's not herself at times, so Miyu's gotta track her down again and again as I continue to get separated. Man, this game is so much more fun to explore, and not just because you're not looking around the same building over and over, but also because I feel like the actual area design stands out much better. Each room is more thoroughly decorated this time, and they do a better job of sticking out as something unique. And I freaking love how how practical it all feels. It genuinely feels like these environments would have been used in the context of the people living here and the rituals they would perform. Uh, right here, for instance, there's two staircases that split off from one another but end up in the same spot. Now, gameplay-wise, this serves zero purpose. Either way brings you to the exact same area, but it's like this because during the ritual that would have been performed here years and years ago, they would have had one of the twins take one path and the other twin take the other. Dude, I had such a good freaking time exploring this game. Game, there is nothing quite like walking through a dilapidated village getting to look at angles like this. Oh my god, these fixed angles this time, they are so good. Like, man, whoever set up these shots, they knew what they were doing. Oh, that Dutch tilt though, yo. Oh, look at this one. Oh my god, the rooftops. Oh my god, these shots are so good. However, in some of the later buildings, I did find the constantly changing camera angles to be a little bit disorienting, and not like in a good way like Silent Hill 1 did. Uh, this house here has a lot of hallways, and I found myself getting turned around and having a hard time remembering which way goes where, so I was bringing up the map like every two seconds, and that really killed the pace of this one area for me. I feel like they really should have established a line of access here, so it'd be easier to keep track of which direction goes which way. If that were consistent instead of constantly changing, it would have been much easier to navigate this area. Well, that or have less hallways, that'd probably work too. This is the Tachibana house and it was easily the most annoying part of this game. You gotta chase this ghost girl through the house, and you have like four mini-boss encounters with her. She is a pain in the ass to keep tracking down, and then a bigger pain in the ass to fight over and over. The mini-bosses do all have some pretty interesting aspects this time, though. They all behave very differently, and some have unique gimmicks, like this little girl and her twin doll. You've gotta find the real one. Taking a picture of the doll won't do any damage, and is only there to distract you. Another thing this game does way better is the puzzle. Puzzles. Yeah, remember those annoying sliding block puzzles? Gone. And how the game would just auto-use any key items for you. Reworked, so that's not the entire puzzle anymore. There's plenty of stuff here that'll jog your brain and have you do a little bit of logical thinking to arrange stuff and whatnot. And there's some where you gotta cross-reference with your notes, too. Like this one where you've gotta put a bunch of books on a bookshelf in a certain order corresponding to what the book's about. I still wouldn't say the puzzles are as good as something you'd see in other horror games, particularly Silent Hill,
still, but they're undeniably a huge upgrade over the first game. But I'd say the biggest upgrade of all is the story. Fatal Frame 1 I found way too wordy. There were too many notes tracking too many different characters that all contributed to too many different subplots. It wasn't a bad story overall, but I found it a little bit hard to follow and a little bit disinteresting sometimes. Fatal Frame 2 has a much more focused narrative and a way better balance on the reading material. Instead of more or less trying to get everything across in the form of notes, it instead lets those notes set the scene, giving you the starting details, and then it follows up on them with cutscenes or NPCs that act upon those details. And then you'll find supplementary material that further expands upon it with more detail. The notes are all categorized a lot better too. Any series of multiple pages from a single character is now given a consistent cover. Everything from this lady is in this red notebook. Everything from the outsider is in the folklorist notes. Everything from this young girl is in the crimson notes. It's way easier to recognize when something is from a certain character's perspective. And the ghosts, while not as scary, all seem like they have a purpose in the story this time. You've got the priests that were part of the ritual, the angry villagers that surrounded it, or the ghost of this girl that you found in a photograph on your way to the village. Every single ghost truly feels like they were a character involved in this community at one point in time, whether they had direct involvement in the ritual or simply were a victim of the events that ensued in the process, and being able to recognize every single one based on the notes you've read is a really satisfying experience. Now I know they did try to do this sort of thing in the first game, and some of those ghosts, like the Blinded Maiden, were evidently part of the greater plot at hand, but the grand majority of them, even if they do have any place in the game's lore, simply could not make me care about who they were because of the flimsy storytelling. Here in Fatal Frame 2, though, they certainly did achieve what it was they were going for. I also like how the main characters actually feel involved in the plot this time. They're not two people simply observing something that doesn't have anything to do with them. The events they uncover in this village parallels their own lives in very strange ways. So yeah, spoilers, I'll quickly go over what happens and you can skip right here if you don't want to hear what happens. <laughs> Okay, so the plot surrounds this ritual involving these two twin girls, Sai and Yai. In order to prevent a cataclysm called the Repentance that'll curse the village, one twin must strangle the other to death in sacrifice. The people of this village believe that twins were when one soul was split into two bodies, so by killing one of them, the soul could reunite properly back into a single person, and whatever bad things would come to the village would then be appeased. Coincidentally, this parallels the promise that Mio and Mayu made to one another, remaining to together forever. This very ritual, however, ended in failure. See, the ritual happens once every 10 years, and the surviving twin of the previous one obviously knew that one of these girls was going to die. He's been there, he's done that, and he did not want to see these sisters go through what he did. So he sets up a plan for the two to escape the village. Though while Yai successfully escapes, Sai gets left behind, and the people conducting the ritual bring her back to the village, stuck in a pretty bad situation. They don't have both twins, so they can't conduct a ritual, but they have to, or the repentance is going to occur. So in a moment of desperation, they decide to try and conduct a ritual with just the one twin, killing her and offering her body as sacrifice, also offering a kusabi alongside her. Now, if the ritual takes place and there's currently no twins to offer, they'll instead sacrifice what's called a kusabi. It's where they take an outsider and they sacrifice him instead. So that guy that arrived at the village to take pictures with his camera obscura, he ended up being part of the ritual in a way that he never could have predicted. Yeah, this poor ass guy, they just murdered him for the ritual, Jesus. But the problem here was that her sister's body wasn't there for her soul to reunite with, so the ritual fails, despite them also offering an outsider, and Sai's spirit instead returns alongside the Kusabi as vengeful ghosts that massacre the entire village. This is all told in such a cool way. You've got the notes for the setups and the details, but as you explore the village, you witness a lot of these events firsthand through these black and white flashbacks, Mayu and Mio often taking place of Yai and Sai, respectively. Your actions here in modern day will mirror the actions that surrounded that ritual. Now, you might have noticed that Yai and Sai kind of look identical to Mayu and Mio. I'm unsure if this is simply to represent that the twins are reliving their memories, or if it's meant to be taken more literally, as if uh, maybe they're a reincarnation of the original twins or something like that. I'm not too sure on that. Either way, they both coincidentally fill the roles of each respective twin, Mio and Yai being the twin that ran ahead, leaving their sister behind, and Mayu and Sai being the one left to suffer. Throughout the game, it's implied that Mayu is periodically being possessed by Sai and tries to get her 
her and Mio to finally finish the ritual all of these years later, which of course would require one of these twins to strangle the other to death which is not what we want, we just want to go home. Now, like any good old horror game, this has multiple endings. The first one's pretty funny, actually. Uh, during the final chapter, you can just leave the village without Mayu, and you get a bad ending where you abandon your sister. In the standard ending, you have a final boss fight with the ghost of the Gusabi, and afterwards, Mio finds herself strangling Mayu to death, and their souls reunite, finally completing the ritual, lifting the curse off the village, and, in the most literal way possible, fulfilling her promise to Mayu that they would be together forever. You know, I actually thought that whole thing was a little bit dumb at first, like the whole we're together forever thing, like that's the reoccurring theme here, really? But once I got to that ending and I understood the nature of the ritual, it's like, oh my god, it is so sinister and man, it's sort of a downer ending, but in a really interesting and like almost poetic sort of way, you know? There is another ending where both sisters do escape the village, though, Mio becoming blind in the process, which you unlock for finishing the game on hard mode on a second playthrough, but it's not considered canon. During this ending, you get an extra final boss fight against Sai, and man, she is definitely harder than the Kusabi. She looks so incredibly sinister and intimidating just standing there with that blood-red aura around her. The Xbox version also has another ending exclusive to it, apparently, but I don't don't know anything about it because I don't have it. Fatal Frame 1 also apparently had an extra ending for beating hard mode, but the only difference is that Mafia escapes with you and it's not even considered canon, so I didn't think it'd be worth replaying the entire game all over again just to show it. And like to the Xbox version also had uh, another ending included, but again, I don't have the Xbox version, so I don't know nothing about that. There was one detail that was lost in translation, interestingly enough. Uh, there's this whole thing where the game was going to lead you to believe that Mayu would be the one strangling Mio, until you realize the village does it backwards. Because during the ritual, it's the older twin that strangles the younger, but there's mention of the village considering the second twin to be born to be the elder one. But it's only the Japanese version that we know Mio is the younger twin because she calls Mayu Onichan, which means big sister. But I guess it didn't carry on over because maybe it would have sounded unnatural in English, I don't know. But either way, it was a pretty cool bait and switch that we never got in the West because in our version, we never know which twin is the older one. So yeah, that's pretty much a summary of the plot. I hope I got all the details mostly right. And of course, this is just a rundown. There's way more details that flesh it out pretty thoroughly that you get to uncover. And it is such a fun thing to unravel. And the parallels between the sisters of the ritual and the sisters you play as are super satisfying to pick up on. Do I even need to say this? It is such such a better story, not just because the story itself is probably a lot more interesting overall, but also because the way the story's told. The notes this time are so much easier to follow, but more importantly, they work with the visual storytelling instead of trying to do it all by itself. I do have a couple of criticisms though. Uh, while it does have plenty of different buildings for you to explore, there will be a couple of times where you'll have to backtrack to a previously explored house and look through it all over again sometimes even refighting a boss you already beat, and it does feel a little bit like padding. There is quite a bit of backtracking, and running all the way back can be a little bit exhausting sometimes, but my biggest complaint is how freaking easy this game is. Like, come on, by the end of the game I had more healing items than I knew what to do with. Look at this, I'm invincible, nothing can kill me, I have so many! Perhaps this was to address complaints of Fatal Frame 1 getting too difficult during the final chapter, but you didn't have to make the game this easy. Come on, guys. Well, I guess if you want a more challenging experience, you could always play the Wii version. Yeah, they did a full-on remake of this thing for the Wii back in 2012. It was one of the last games Nintendo ever published on Wii. And yeah, you heard that right, Nintendo published. Weird how Nintendo of all companies is the one that got their hands on Fatal Frame. That's, yeah, what the heck. Fatal Frame 2 Wii Edition, or I guess that's Project Zero Two Wii Edition, or Deep Crimson Butterfly in Japan. We never got it here in North America, it was Japan and Europe only. This version featured a total graphics overhaul, with brand new character models that have much more realistic proportions. 
I gotta say, the graphics on the Wii version are a considerable upgrade. The lighting effects too, it's much more dynamic, and the colors look nicer as well. Though I do think some of the appeal did get lost in the transition. The ghosts just don't look as ghastly, you know? They're less hazy, and I think they look too clear and detailed on the Wii version, if that makes sense. And I also think the twins now look a little bit older than they should. Them being fairly young was pretty important to the game's themes, and in drawing parallels to them and the twins used in the old ritual. The ritual only happens to twins of a very specific age, and with Mayu and Mio now looking older than that, it doesn't really work as well. Probably the biggest change in the Wii version is that the fixed angles were tossed in favor of an over-the-shoulder camera. The game now plays closer to something like RE4, tank controls with a camera glued to your back. And while I am sure some people will prefer this sort of camera, it kind of ruins a lot of the scares. So many brilliant moments were paced delicately by the shifting camera angle, but now since the game cannot guarantee you'll be looking in a certain direction, it often briefly takes control away from the player to show it in a cutscene instead. And I just can't get scared by stuff being shown through cutscenes, because if I'm not in control while it's being shown, then I know it's not an immediate threat. I have a moment to process it. I don't have to worry about how to react because I'm not playing. I'm watching. I kind of expected to use the flashlight by aiming the Wii remote at the TV, because that's how Shattered Memories did it, and it worked great in that game, but no, you have very little control over the flashlight. You can only look up and down by tilting the Wii remote upwards or downwards. I really kind of don't like this. While any other Wii game involving aiming a camera has you pointing a cursor on screen, here it's this weird tilting controls. It doesn't use the sensor bar at all. This is mostly a problem for the combat. You can only look left and right with the stick. Up and down is still only controlled by tilting the Wii remote. You can now lock onto ghosts, but even then it just points you in the general direction. You'll still have to fine tune the cursor over the ghost by, again, tilting the Wii remote. You even have to rotate it left and right to aim the cursor left and right, it's really, it doesn't feel right. It feels too sluggish, man. Like, how am I supposed to know what the game considers neutral? It's not something objective, like letting go of a stick. No, I have to try my best to hold the Wii Remote in the position I think it might maybe kinda move the way I want it to. As I got further into the game, I did manage to adjust to it, but it's still a far cry from the control the PS2 version had. It's not unusable, but it certainly is a pretty big downgrade. And I guess to mitigate the slower controls, they added this compass that just tells you exactly where the ghost is, and I really don't like that, because before it was this nervous game of hot or cold. The closer you were to facing the ghost, the brighter this would light up, but it didn't tell you exactly where it was. Knowing where the ghost is at all times not only takes away from the challenge, but it also takes away from the scare factor. There's no longer this panic sensation of scanning the room desperately trying to keep track of it. Now you just kind of know where it is all the time. God, I feel like every ghost encounter is way longer here too. I I swear, it takes so much longer to deal with them with these controls. Though, I guess I did really like how you can now switch film types with the D-pad on the fly so you don't have to open the menu every time. That is super convenient. Something about this version I found really weird, though, is that it goes back to Fatal Frame 1's combat system, where you charge up each shot instead of it being a matter of distance, which was kind of a weird choice. Maybe they felt that worked better with the Wii controls? I don't know. The upgrade system was also changed back to Fatal Frame 1, so you don't need spirit orbs anymore. Instead, you just buy the upgrades like before, and since the game uses the charging system, the stats in question are also slightly different. Oh, right, they also added this stupid ass thing where every single time you pick up an item, you have to hold down the A button to slowly reach for it, as if to like build anticipation or something. The reason it does this is because there's now a small chance this ghost hand jump scare will happen and deal some damage, so you gotta try to react and pull your hand away if you see it. It is the dumbest shit. It is a stupid jump scare just to cheaply and effortlessly create tension. The game did that just fine as it was. It did not need to tack this on. But you know what? You know what the big flaw in this whole thing is? Like, look at this. Notice how I completely dodge it every single time by a mile. Like, every time! Look, I react before the thing's even on screen. Now, how am I doing that? It's because you can hear the Wii's disc reader loading the hand in every time it's about to happen. So, when you do it, when you're slowly reaching for it, just listen to the Wii. And if it goes... Then you let go. It works literally every time. It completely gives it away. It is the funniest thing. They did try to entice people to play the Wii version by adding some bonus endings. Uh, there's two brand new endings in the Wii version, both of which are achieved by finding these new scenes they added in Chapter 8. 
Uh, spoilers again, I guess. I don't know, I guess we're talking about more endings, even if they're non-canon, and I will be showing the final boss again, so uh, skip here if you don't want to be spoiled on, like, the two non-canon Wii endings and the final boss, I guess. Uh, but I won't be spoiling any major plot details this time. When walking around with Mayu in Chapter 8, visiting certain areas will have you view these new cutscenes where the two reminisce about their past. Uh, beating the final boss after finding all of those scenes will bring you to that extra boss with Sai, just like Hard Mode in the original. Beat her after that and you'll get the Frozen Butterfly ending, where Mio snaps back to her senses and refuses to strangle Mayu. Mayu then completely loses her mind, saying that she doesn't mind being trapped in the village for all eternity so long as she's with Mio. Falling into an absolute state of manic, I guess she killed Mio and turned her into a doll so she can be with her forever? Oh my god, this new ending is terrible! This is evil! Who would want this? Alternately, if you do those extra scenes and then take more than five minutes to finish the boss, I don't know how it would take you that long, uh, you get the Shadow Festival ending, where we flash back to a festival the twins went to in the village years and years ago, remembering the moments they cherished together. The repentance happens once again as the twins share this memory, and I guess they're stuck in the village forever once again. Except this time they're both happy and together, which I guess is a little better? That bonus Xbox ending is also included, the promise ending, but while you just had to beat the hardest difficulty on Xbox to get it, here you have to beat the final boss in less than one minute. This is like impossible! I was going at it for like an hour and a half before giving it up, I just could not do it. You need an incredible amount of luck getting those perfect shots, and after like 20 freaking attempts, my patience simply ran out. I guess the Wii version also has some extras, uh, there's a brand new haunted house mode. The idea is that you hold the A button to slowly walk through this house while a bunch of scary ghosts walk by and have to try to not get scared by them. It's pretty much Jew on the grudge on Wii, except on rails. How does the game know you're scared? Well, by recognizing the movement in the Wii remote in Nunchuck. I guess the idea is that if something scares you, you'll jump or shiver and the Wii remote will recognize that movement. But I swear I was still as a statue the entire time and it would still randomly dock me points. I really don't understand it. There's two additional modes where you take photos and collect dolls, but I didn't really find them particularly interesting. Well, I guess all that's left in the Wii version is the shop. You can buy bonus upgrades for your camera for additional playthroughs and a bunch of costumes. Mario. What? You will be able to purchase this after certain conditions? What conditions? How do you get this? I need this. I, I, you guys know how much I love stupid ass unlockable costumes in games. And are you kidding me? They have a Mario and Luigi costume for the twins? Hell yes, I need this. How do I get it? How do I get it? How do I get it? Well, one minute. Okay, how hard could it be? Come here, you big pile of dick. Oh, that wasn't fast. Okay, let's try again. Okay, this time we're gonna... Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yes, 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 all right. Oh, and I, I did... I'm out of time already? How are you supposed to do this? Piece of shit. Suck my floppy Fortnite dick, asshole. <laughs> wait, wait, yes! Okay, so the promise ending is like actually the happiest version of the ending. Yeah, Yai finally reunites with Sai, the two complete the ritual, and the twins leave the village as the sun finally rises, which shows that the village is cursed no longer. But I don't care about any of that. Now I get to replay the game dressed as Mario and Luigi. Hell yeah. I know Nintendo has been no stranger to letting other games borrow the characters' costumes in recent years, but I had no idea it dated all the way back to this game. And dude, like, replaying Fatal Frame 2 dressed as Mario and Luigi makes the game incredible incredibly entertaining in a whole new way. And I guess that just about covers it. Yeah, this is a pretty amazing sequel. It plays into Fatal Frame's strengths while pretty much solving everything I had a problem with in the first game. I totally see why people consider this one of the greatest horror games of all time. It is top to bottom a fantastic game. I could sit here and clown on the Wii version all night long, but the fact of the matter is, it's not the best version of this game. It has nicer graphics and those bonus costumes are pretty great, but overall I think the broader changes are for the worst, so stick with the PS2 version. Or the Xbox version, I hear that one's good too. Now, like a lot of PS2 horror games, the Fatal Frame series isn't exactly what you'd call inexpensive. I'm not talking triple digits, but it'll definitely run you more than you should ever have to pay for a PS2 game. Especially Fatal Frame 2, it being the most popular and sought after title in the series. Luckily though, the first three Fatal Frame games have all been re-released digitally on PS3. Ten bucks a pop, exactly as they should be, so if you're at loss for a physical copy, that's a good spot to cop it. 
where do you even go from here? I mean, the only real improvements I could think of making is uh, maybe cut down to the backtracking a little bit, make the game a little bit less easy, and maybe up the scares again. But either way, this is going to be a pretty hard one to top. They probably won't top it, honestly, but regardless, I'm still pretty interested in seeing where the series is going to go from here on, good or bad. So uh, yeah, next time we'll be taking a look at Fatal Frame 3, The Tormented. I'll see you guys then.